your passcode, please. Please stand by. We're about to begin. Good day and welcome to the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse Behavioral Economics at Tax Time webinar. Today's conference is being recorded, and at this time I'd like to turn the conference over to Dr. Jeanette Hersick, Project Director of SSRC. Please go ahead, ma'am. Thank you, um, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, uh, my name is Jeanette Hersick, and I am the Project Director for the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse, which is also known as the SSRC. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, I just want to take a few minutes to highlight some of the functionality of the SSRC. Um, the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse is really a virtual portal of research and resources related to self-sufficiency, and it functions as an online community for networking between researchers, practitioners, and stakeholders interested in uh, knowing more and learning more around self-sufficiency, employment programs, family and child well-being. Um, the purpose of the SSRC is to disseminate quality research, and we currently have over 2,900 items in our library, and we are constantly adding new resources and providing opportunities to the field for networking such as today's webinar. Um, the library, um, as you can see on the right side of the slide, um, are, I'll, I'll step back for a minute. Across the top are the um, major landing pages. Oops. Oops. Uh, the major landing pages for um, the SSRC, um, which is the, one of the first buttons is to search the library. That will immediately get you into uh, the library where you can do a complete search. The highlight here is around browse topics, and, and the architecture or the framework for the SSRC is really focused on 12, 12 um, topics associated with the field of self-sufficiency. So interested users can select the Browse Topics tab and view resources and publications within a specific topic. Um, every included item in the library is reviewed for relevancy, and we have an Our Librarian Recommends feature, which enables users to view research by topic that have been recommended by our library team. Uh, the library includes federal laws, regulations specific to each topical area, and it highlights legislative resources available for low-income uh, individuals. Uh, the next slide, I think. Um, SSRC users um, may select the Stay Connected tab to view an events calendar that includes information on in-person or virtual events and conferences. Um, the SSRC also houses a number of data sets and sources for users to support program improvement and facilitate improved outcomes for children, families, and communities. Finally, also under the Stay Connected tab is a list of organizations that have partnered with the SSRC to host events and share publications related to the field of self-sufficiency. This is where we house materials from previously hosted events, so please check out this tab for previous webinar recordings and any additional materials. Okay, today's webinar um, will feature three speakers. Um, we are very happy uh, that, to have Joe Valenti, who is the Director of Asset Building at American Progress, uh, with us as our first speaker. Prior to joining American Progress, he was a Hamilton Fellow at the U.S. Treasury Department, serving as a research analyst, working with the community development, financial institutions, and new markets tax credit program. He previously served as a senior analyst at the New York City Office of Financial Empowerment, the first local government initiative geared towards educating, empowering, and protecting low-income consumers, and as an associate at the Aspen Institute's Initiative on Financial Security. Welcome, Joe. Um, our second speaker will be Mikhail Grinston-Weiss, 
who is an associate professor at the Brown School of Social Work at Washington University in St. Louis and is the associate director of the Center for Social Development. She currently is leading the Refund to Savings Evaluation Initiative, which will measure the effect of behavioral economics interventions that seek to increase saving and tax time. Dr. Grinstein Weiss also serves as a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, as a research associate for the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, and as a fellow for the Center of Community Capital. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Gail Hamilton, who is a senior fellow in the Low Wage Workers and Communities Policy Area at MDRC. Dr. Hamilton has designed and directed numerous large-scale evaluations and demonstrations of programs intended to improve the well-being of low-income populations. She currently is leading a random assignment evaluation of Save USA, a new tax time savings program for low-income individuals, and is co-leading an implementation evaluation of Project RISE, a new education-conditioned internship program for disconnected young adults. Um, so that we can hear from all of our speakers and have time to discuss these efforts, we will have one consolidated Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Uh, participants can submit questions throughout the webinar through the question and answer feature on the bottom right side of your screen. And again, you can do that throughout the webinar. If we receive more questions than our speakers have time to answer, we will post their responses on the SSRC with other webinar materials after the event. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Valenti. Great. Thank you. I'd like to thank the Self-Sufficiency Research Clearinghouse for organizing today's webinar, and uh, I'd like to thank, in particular, uh, Jeanette and Gail and Nicole for uh, contributing to a fantastic event today. So, going to the next slide here. Just going to set things up with a quick summary of why tax filing is extremely relevant as a subject of analysis and the importance of behavioral research around tax time before getting into our other presentations. Tax filing is a very unique opportunity to examine how financial decisions are made. We have 110 million tax filers receiving a federal income tax refund in a typical year, and 76 million of those are low and moderate income families earning less than $50,000 with an average refund of more than $2,000. Three quarters of American households filing taxes typically receive refunds, and there are multiple explanations for this. It may be uh, something unintentional in terms of households not uh, understanding withholding forms or not updating withholding forms as their circumstances change, but for others it may very well be an intentional choice uh, based on the attraction of receiving a refund in April instead of facing a tax bill. And it's also due to the presence of refundable tax credits that benefit consumers even when they exceed uh, that consumer's tax liability. A brief note on the earned income tax credit, which is the refundable credit that greatly contributes to uh, these refunds. Of the 76 million low and moderate income tax filers who received refunds in 2010, 27 million were EITC recipients. The EITC uh, substantially benefits households with dependent children. A single parent earning $20,000 would receive a credit of over $2,800 with one child. With three or more children, the maximum credit can exceed $6,000. So we're talking about substantial amounts of money uh, flowing toward low-income families at tax time. And the EITC phases out at incomes between $36,000 and $50,000 for families with children there is a much lower benefit that phases out at a lower income range for tax filers who do not have dependent children. It's important to point out that this includes childless adults as well as non-custodial parents. So we have these substantial refunds, uh, anywhere from $2,000 to upwards of $6,000, and there is some research about where these refunds go. It's typically the largest single payment that a low-income family will receive during the year. And mental accounting would suggest that uh, tax refunds like bonuses and other irregular contributions are going to be treated differently 
from regular paychecks. EITC refunds are typically used for uh, existing needs, uh, in some cases deferred costs of furniture, appliances, winter coats are a very typical example. As you can see by the graph, 84% uh, of recipients in two cities uh, that were studied uh, used ref a por at least a portion of their refunds to pay debt and cover bills. 61% used their refunds for various child-related expenses. It is important to note that 47% devoted at least part of their refund towards savings. So savings is something that folks are thinking about at tax time. To help frame our understanding of the decision of whether or not to save at tax time, it's important to look through the behavioral economics lens as we're doing today and looking beyond rational economic theory to uncover the various motivations and biases for uh, consumption and savings decisions. I'll just walk through a few basic principles of behavioral economics. One is to understand the difference in perception between gains and losses. Uh, when study participants have been asked if they would prefer a 2% raise in a year where uh, the inflation rate was 4% or a 2% pay cut in a year with no inflation, generally speaking, uh, study participants would choose the 2% raise even though quantitatively speaking, the outcomes are the same in both circumstances. This also helps explain the presence of large tax refunds in the sense that gains are preferable to losses. Uh, behavioral economics also is concerned with perceptions of time. There was a famous experiment over 10 years ago called Save More Tomorrow that uh, implored workers to increase their retirement savings, not by changing the amount that they were contributing to a 401k today, because that would involve a loss of income in the short term, but of committing part of every raise toward retirement. And that was proven to be quite successful uh, without, again, uh, reducing one's ability to consume in the short term. And the use of the faults is also critical uh, in looking at behavioral economics. I have two quick examples. The first is a non-financial example. I think sometimes uh, that's more helpful than a financial case. Uh, if we think of elevators versus stairs, and elevators in many situations being the default, elevators may be what is closest to someone walking into a building. Uh, elevators are certainly more convenient. The CDC and others have been looking at ways to encourage the use of stairs to facilitate exercise and looked at how to make stairs the default. If you walk into a new building that's been constructed in the last few years, you may see that architects are making stairs a more prominent feature, uh, more central to the building. But even in a building with uh, an existing stairwell, as in the CDC example, the use of lighting and artwork and open doors can make stairwells a more inviting choice and to push people in office buildings and apartment buildings and others to take the stairs rather than the elevator. The same concept of the faults can be applied in terms of retirement savings. These numbers come from Fidelity, although this is something that's been repeated uh, quite a bit in many workplaces. Prior to 2006, it was uh, overwhelmingly the case at uh, companies offering 401k plans that you would receive information about enrolling in the plan uh, your first day on the job, but that you had to opt into the plan. You would need to sign up and specify your contribution levels and investment options and all of those choices. And generally speaking, just over half of all workers would opt into participating in the 401k plan under that scenario about one-fifth of younger workers aged 20 to 24 would take the steps to opt into the, the retirement savings or 401k plan. After companies started switching from opt-in to opt-out, so setting the default that you will be enrolled in the 401k plan unless you decide otherwise, inertia uh, held the day and 82% of all workers uh, 
participated in 401k plans. They did not ultimately choose to opt out, which is a dramatic increase. The increase was even larger for younger workers, age 20 to 24, uh, where the um, participation in plans jumped from 20% to 76%. And one of the reasons why this is policy relevant is that the only change that's made here is switching from opt-in to opt-out. No other changes were made in terms of plan benefits or uh, costs or investment options or anything else. It was simply switching the default from opt-in to opt-out. We look at behavioral economics at tax time. Tax filers are a very captive audience for behavioral research and policy development. The study participants are already present every year, uh, whether it is at a volunteer tax prep site or a for-profit tax preparer. Tax filers are also already thinking about money. Uh, they may have been planning on how they intend to use their refund, again, for deferred expenses or uh, for savings or other purposes and they're looking for trusted sources. In some cases, it might be the closest they will come in the course of a year to sitting down and discussing their finances. Tax preparers also already fulfill a lot of other roles for low-income consumers. On the positive side, uh, tax prep sites in person, as well as some uh, internet tools and for-profit tax preparers provide benefit screening. Uh, they have provided increased healthcare access and enrollment, particularly under the Affordable Care Act, uh, some will offer bank account opening at tax preparation sites and other opportunities. Tax preparers have also used tax time for uh, less ideal purposes in terms of how tax refunds are used through refund anticipation loans, uh, high cost prepaid cards, uh, various predatory financial products. My favorite example in this case is uh, the GAO had reported a few years ago that some shoe stores and used car dealers were also offering tax preparation services so that they would be able to uh, get their hands on refund dollars before those dollars could go to other purposes. So there is definitely a captive audience here and it's an area where tax preparers have a very uh, unique value add in terms of delivering services to consumers. And it's also policy relevant because savings matters quite extensively for working families' economic stability. Uh, having even a small amount of savings, less than $2,000, uh, drastically reduces uh, various material hardships such as food insecurity, skipping meals, foregone doctor visits, uh, missed housing or utility payments. And yet in multiple national surveys, uh, between 40 to 50 percent of respondents at all income levels, not just low-income Americans, report that they would probably or certainly not be able to come up with $2,000 in 30 days to deal with an emergency. So having even uh, small amounts of savings can make a very big difference for families, especially for low-income families. In the absence of savings, these families may very well turn to high-cost, potentially predatory credit options such as payday or auto title loans and uh, only become even more financially vulnerable. So I have here a few selected resources for further reading. Uh, if you're curious about some of the behavioral experiments that I mentioned or some of the other statistics that I cited. And uh, I look forward to your questions. But first, I'll happy to turn it over to Mikal from the Center for Social Development. OK. Thank you so much, Joe. And thank you, Emily, for organizing and um, inviting me to talk here. Um, and good afternoon to everyone, and good morning to people on the um, uh, East Coast, West Coast. I, today I'm going to talk about the Refund to Saving uh, initiative. This is an exciting collaboration between the industry and academia with partnership between Intuit Center for Social Development and Dan O'Reilly at Duke University. And also I want to, of course, acknowledge my research team at the Center for Social Development for all their valuable help and hard work on this initiative. So the initiative came to address and tackle some of the useful background that Joe was talking about, how we can get more people to save a tax time and, and build on this golden moment that uh, we can intervene when people have money in the, the people know that they're getting a refund, but the money is not quite yet in their hand. So the plan of our initiative was to develop and test a model for a universal, scalable saving policy 
And it's currently one of the largest saving experiments ever conducted in the United States in terms of sample size. So here is a little bit of illustration of the refund to saving initiative and what it is that we have done. So we are partnered with um, Intuit that allow us access to the free file um, TurboTax software that offering um, that is under the IRS free file program of offering a public-private partnership and free online tax prep to low-income um, middle-class taxpayers. And we embedded an intervention within that software. And we were able to do a randomized control trial where we were able to intervene with about 600, 840, uh, 600, 4,800 participants that went through our uh, randomized control trial. And then at the end of the, um, the experiment, we also did a very detailed household financial survey with about 20,000 households. So immediately after people went through our experiment, which I will walk you in a minute on what it includes and what it looks like, we also did a um, detailed look on their household finance through an uh, online web survey with about 20,000 households. And then six months later, we were um, six months later we were able to repeat the survey with about uh, 8,300. Um, server takers. So this is uh, who is eligible to participate in our experiment, to qualify to be in the uh, TurboTax uh, free file, you have to earn uh, at 31, doesn't, okay, here it is, 31 uh, or less on your adjusted gross income, be on an active military duty and earn a a little bit more, or be qualified to earn income tax credit. So now I'll walk you a little bit through the intervention and what it is that we have done and how we brought kind of behavioral economics into the experience of going through the turbo tax. So as people are went through filling out their taxes and entering all the information and where they were told like getting to their um, end of filling all the information, they see their federal refund, and that's the moment when we intervene. At that moment, we, before they need to make a decision to choose on whether they are, um, how they want to get the refund, whether it is directly a paper check or to a direct deposit, and whether it's to saving or checking, that's when we introduce a behavioral economic prompt. So we ask uh, our participants, do you have enough money for an emergency? A Harvard study found that most Americans could not come up with $2,000 for something unexpected. We can help you stay prepared. So this is one example of the prompt that we are introducing. And again, it's, a, it's being part of a randomized control trial, so different treatment groups are receiving different type of prompts. So you can see here different examples of prompt. Family prompt, getting people to think about the family, or getting people to think about the future, or as I just showed, getting people to think about emergency. So this is some behavioral economics techniques that we are using in embedding into the TurboTax software. Another technique we are using is anchoring. Anchoring is a tendency of people to stay on or close to a set uh, suggested amount. And this is what we were trying to test. We wanted to see if we offer people different amount that they should save out of save of the refund if that will make a difference. And we suggested people that they, uh, again, different combination, but some people we suggested they should save 25% of, uh, of the refund. For some groups, we suggested they save 50% of the refund. And yet, for some other people, we suggest 75% of the refund. And we, you see on this slide that we're not only suggesting how much they should they should save. We're also pre-populating it. So there is amount uh, that is pre-populated and calculated for them. So what it is at 25% of the refund, or what it is 75% of the refund, it's already, the number is already calculated and preloaded into, um, you know, 
the, uh, the saving place. Um, and lastly, with people who doesn't or did not choose savings, uh, we introduce another kind of um, button they need to push, which say, "I don't need to save," and then they can hit continue. So just briefly talking about uh, the participants who were in the experiment, you can see that uh, we had participated with quite low income populations, kind of poor of the poor, and um, the numbers here are medians, but still quite low. Uh, we also have a modest uh, amount of refund, these people are getting modest refund, and the majority of them, like about almost 70%, were filing as single. So I want to walk you through the questions I want to address today in this webinar. Um, so three key questions. Can the overall economics techniques increase deposit to saving a tax time? Does the R2S intervention increase savings six months later? So do we have a long-term kind of six months impact? And what factors are associated with savings? So I'll start with focusing on question number one. So our overall top line result is that we were able to increase the number of people who deposit to a saving account. We estimate that we have created additional uh, 4,800 savers that participants that uh, put money into savings that would otherwise wouldn't have done without the intervention. We also estimate that we increased the amount of deposit into saving by about $6 million. The next slide is a nice illustration of how our intervention looks. So you can see all the groups that involved. The green bar is representing the control group or the group who did not receive any specific encodement to save, like saving prompts or specific amount suggested for saving. The dark blues are um, people who suggest who receive a specific amount and an anchoring of 25%. Um, and the light blue is different combination of prompts with a different with a 50% uh, suggested amount of savings. And as you can see, that although splitting is pretty uncommon among all conditions, uh, the intervention ne nearly doubled the amount of splitting of people splitting the refund into a saving account or savings bond. The next graph is presenting similar results, just looking on the amount saved, and you can see that the intervention is associated with higher amount deposit into savings account. Similar trend. And this yes, next graph shows us the results for splitters. As we can see that the intervention, the intervention got uh, splitters to save more. Almost across all key groups, participants on average deposit almost $200 more uh, into savings when compared to the control group. So now I'm going to address the second question, does RTS increase savings six months later, trying to see the uh, long-term kind of impact of the intervention? So with this uh, bar graph, we can be looking on probability of people uh, still having their savings six months later. So what is the probability that when we re-interview you six months later, you still have part of your refund? What we find is that among those who were encouraged to save with an anchor of 50% or 75%, uh, they had 30% chance of still having uh, their savings six months later. But when we look on the people who were not encouraged to save, the control group, um, we found that they have a 25% chance of still having savings six months later. So about five percentage point difference. Now looking on the saving amount, we see that people who were assigned to an anchoring of um, a 50% had 2.6 percentage point more save at the six month follow up compared to the control group. And people who were assigned to the anchor of 75% at 5 percentage point more save at the six month follow up. 
as well they fell you know a lot to the two thousand dollars as kind of a um, magic number or number that repeat a lot as an important number to people uh, should have as an emergency saving or some saving we also use this question that is um, based on the Luzardi and Tufano study and we ask our server responded question uh, like how confident they are that they can come up with two thousand dollars in a case of emergency in general, we find that people who received the R2S intervention were more confident in their perception of financial uh, insecurity, um, financial security six months later. So specifically, if you look on comparing the people, the um, people who receive an uh, anchoring, for example, of 75%, encouraging them to save 75% of the refund, uh, and the control group, you see 12 percentage point difference in their confidence that they can come up uh, with $2,000 six months later. Okay. So now I want to share with you some of the factors that we found that were associated with savings. We looked on a lot of things, but trying to just bring into a quick presentation a few highlights. So some of the factors that we were trying to see on the relationship to savings include financial shocks, different types of debt, use of alternative financial services and asset limits. Okay. We asked our sample uh, whether they experienced any of the following um, financial shock in the last six months, like trip to the hospital, major vehicle repair, a period of unemployment, or um, legal fees and expenses. We found that 66% uh, experienced at least one of these following uh, financial shocks. And you can see the exact number on the slide. It might not be surprising that people who were experienced these financial shocks were less likely to save compared to people who did not experience financial shocks when we um, follow up with them uh, the six months follow up. A very interesting picture arises when we look on debt. So while we don't find, we, we're separating between secure debt and unsecured debt. And when, when we look on secure debt, we don't really find a strong relationship to savings. So secure debt such as mortgage, for example, we don't find a um, strong relati relationship to saving. When we look on unsecured debt, such as credit card, paid in loan, medical bills, we found that people who have unsecured debt uh, are much less likely to save at a six-month follow-up compared to people who don't have this kind uh, of debt. We also look on the use of alternative financial services such as uh, check cashers and paid and loan, etc. And um, as can be expected, we found that people who did not use alternative financial services are much more likely to save than people who use alternative financial services. And finally, we look on um, you know, asset limit and perception of asset limit. So we ask our server responded um, to agree with the statement saying, if I save more, I would lose my government benefit. Um, and what we find is that the more people are tend to agree with this statement, the less likely they are to save. So just a quick summary and wrap up of our findings. We do find that the r uh, increased both the number and amount of uh, deposits into savings accounts. Uh, we um, finding that impact to last for six months, so this short intervention still shows some impact. Uh, six months in the six months follow up. Uh, when we look on the specific behavioral -like techniques, we find that anchoring to be more effective than prompt. And we find several of, um, you know, factors to facilitate uh, uh, savings might make it easier or harder to save, including financial shock, debt, use of alternative financial services, and, um, and asset limits. Of course, we want to thank our funders who made this uh, all possible. 
And again, thanks for the webinar organizer. And I'm looking forward to yeah, answering your questions later. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Gail Hamilton from MDRC. OK, thank you. Um, and as the others have mentioned, thank you to the organizers um, uh, for pulling this webinar together. Um, it's, it's been very interesting listening to the first two presentations. Um, so again, um, I'm Gail Hamilton. And I'm going to be highlighting some findings uh, from a just completed Save USA evaluation interim report. Um, and this report can be found on the website on the MDRC website. And I'll be uh, speaking today on behalf of all the people shown in this first slide um, who've been working for several years on this evaluation and uh, co-authored uh, this report, the current report. Uh, next slide. Um, so briefly, what is Save USA? Uh, it's a program based on an earlier initiative uh, conceived and operated in New York City that encourages low and moderate income tax filers to deposit some or all of their tax refund directly into a matchable savings account. And money in the account can be used for any purpose. Uh, slide three. Our next slide, please. Um, but before I go into more detail, um, I'd like to recognize the many funders who've been involved in this project. Uh, supporting program operations, as well as the research. And shown in this slide is a list of them, and we're very grateful uh, for their support. Uh, in the next slide, um, I'd also like to acknowledge the many partners involved in the project. Uh, several organizations shown here were responsible for program operations. We also involved a number of financial partners, five banks, and a credit union. In addition, uh, several New York City groups listed here managed the project. And finally, MDRC conducted the evaluation. So the next slide gives you a little more detail about the Save USA savings opportunity. Um, essentially, Save USA takes advantage of the fact uh, that's been mentioned by uh, both Joe and McCall that tax refunds typically constitute the largest one-time source of cash that low and moderate income people usually receive. Um, and like the initiative McCall just described, um, Save USA seeks to leverage the tax refund for savings. Specifically at Save USA, uh, tax filers can directly deposit between $200 and $1,000 from their tax refunds into a special account. And if they leave their pledged savings amount untouched for a year, they get a 50% match. Um, funds in the Save USA account, account can be used to pay for emergency expenses or for any other purpose uh, the tax filer wants to um, use them for. As part of the evaluation, at this point, individuals have been allowed to deposit money in Save USA accounts and be eligible for matches for three years now. This next slide uh, gives a little more information about who is eligible uh, for the program and how people were enrolled. Uh, tax filers are eligible for Save USA if they're at least 18. They meet certain income requirements shown here uh, on the slide and have a refund of at least $200. Uh, Save USA has been marketed for several years now to individuals at 17 volunteer income tax assistance or VITA sites across four cities, New York City, Tulsa, New, York, New Jersey, and San Antonio. Next slide, please. Um, and as you can surmise from the description of Save USA, the program incorporates, incorporates several behavioral economics principles, which were built into the program which, when it was first designed in New York City in 2008. Um, it includes a simplified option to save, a separate account for savings, 
distinct from a checking account, easy electronic and automatic deposit into the account, incentives to maintain savings in the form of a high match rate if people um, uh, save their money in the account for a year, and then disincentives to remove even small amounts of savings in that eligibility for the match is forfeited if people do so. Next slide, please. Um, MDRC is conducting a comprehensive evaluation of Save USA. We're examining the implementation of the program in all four of the involved cities, and we're examining the impact or the effectiveness of the program using a random assignment design in two of the four cities, in New York City and in Tulsa. In these two cities, tax filers eligible for Save USA and interested in the program were randomly assigned to either a Save USA group eligible for Save USA or a regular tax filers group not eligible for Save USA. And since we used random assignments, the two groups started out virtually identical in their characteristics and in things that are hard to measure, like their motivation to save. So as a result, we can compare the behavior of these two groups over time and have high confidence that any difference, differences we see between the groups in their savings pattern or in their financial situations are due to the effects of their eligibility for Save USA. Uh, next slide. In terms of the specifics of the evaluation, um, across all four cities, we're addressing several implementation research questions. Uh, how is the program marketed and operated? How do enrollees differ from tax filers who were eligible for Save USA but did not enroll? To what extent did people get the match? Who received the match? And finally, what were savings and withdrawal patterns? Um, next slide, please. Um, in our investigation of the impact or effects of Save USA, we're comparing outcomes for the randomly assigned Save USA and regular tax filers group. Again, any differences we see between the groups represent the added value of Save USA. And our main impact questions are shown here. First, we're examining the extent to which Save USA, relative to what would have happened in the absence of the program, increases savings and other measures of financial security. Second, we're looking at the extent to which Save USA, again, relative to what people would have done without the program, affected debt, reliance on high cost credit, and material hardship. And we're putting all these things together, kind of uh, looking at what's often called a balance sheet um, uh, effect. And finally, we're examining whether Save USA had effects that were different by city or for other subgroups, such as for younger versus older tax filers. Um, in the currently available uh, report, we're addressing these questions using an 18-month follow-up period, and eventually we'll look again at these same questions using a 36 to 42-month follow-up period. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we show uh, the data sources that we're using in the study. Um, these data sources include VITA intake surveys, other baseline information, data from financial institutions, the ones involved in Save USA, tax returns, and follow-up surveys. And our sample size, sizes vary depending on the analysis. Um, for demographics and account use patterns, we analyze data for sample members in all four cities, which gives us a sample size of over 2,300 people. For impacts on direct savings deposits, the types of um, like tax day effects Macau mentioned, um, we have data on over 1,500 people, representing 100% of those randomly assigned in the two impact cities. And then for impacts on behavior in the 18 months following random assignment, we have survey data on over 1,200 people, representing 80% of those randomly assigned. 
And this high survey response rate, in addition uh, to results of some survey bias analyses we conducted, uh, gives us a lot of confidence that the 80% who responded to the 18-month survey are, represented, are representative of all those randomly assigned, and that there's few, if any, differences between Sur Save USA group survey respondents and regular tax filer group survey respondents. So uh, next slide. Uh, let's look at the findings we have at this point, starting with the implementation ones. Um, in the next slide, um, you see the characteristics of enrollees in each of the four involved cities. Um, across all four cities, uh, 2,338 tax filers under the age of 65 enrolled in the study in 2011. And this 2011 enrollee group is the group we're following in the evaluation. And uh, as you can see in the far right column in this slide, uh, among enrollees, the average age was 39. Over half of the enrollees were single tax filers with dependents. Their average adjusted gross income for 2010 was about $18,000, a very low average. And their average combined federal, state, local tax refund was about $3,900. Um, turning to the next slide, uh, in terms of 2011 recruitment and enrollment, we found that Save USA was strongly marketed in and successfully integrated into the tax return preparation processes at the 17 involved VITA sites. Overall, roughly one in 10 Save USA eligible tax filers at these sites were interested in Save USA and enrolled in the study. And finally, we also found that Save USA study enrollees were very similar to those who were eligible but not interested in, enroll in enrolling. But on average, uh, the enrollees were in a better position somewhat to save. Some of this evidence. Um, some of the evidence for this is that enrollees were more likely to have dependents and thus were more likely to get the EITC and a larger tax refund compared to those who did not enroll. And in addition, enrollees tended to have slightly higher adjusted gross incomes. So in the next slide, um, we show account activity for the 2011 enrollees. And we've grouped Tulsa and New York City together since we calculate Save USA's effects for this same group of people. So thus, these uh, stati statistics that you see here uh, represent the Save USA action that we are measuring the effects of. And as you can see for Tulsa and New York City, over half of the individuals randomly assigned to the Save USA group got a savings match in 2012 and over a quarter got a savings match the next year, in 2013. In 2012, the average match amount was $95, including zeros for people who did not deposit again or get a match. But the average match amount, just counting those who did deposit in the second year and got a match, was $351. So starting with the next slide, let's look at the impacts or the effects of Save USA as of 18 months after people were randomly assigned in uh, Tulsa and New York City. Um, but first, uh, going to the next slide, let's look at what impacts might be hypothetically expected given the underlying theories of the Save USA model and the timing of our currently available follow-up. So this graph shows what we might expect in terms of impacts, in other words, program control differences on the total savings held by sample members. So starting at month zero, uh, when people were randomly assigned to research groups as part of the study, there would have been no differences between, in savings between the two groups. But then as Save USA group members deposited money from their tax refunds into their newly opened Save USA accounts, 
a big difference in savings would be expected between the two research groups. And then as Save USA group members needed to use their savings for emergencies or other purposes, the difference in savings between the two groups would have gone down. But at around 12 to 14 months after entering the study, individuals who had saved their original deposit for a year would have received a savings match. And in addition, around the same time, individuals would have filed their taxes again, and many in the Save USA group again deposited part of their next tax refund into their Save USA account. And in the following six months, some Save USA group members would be expected to withdraw their savings for emergencies or other needs again. And as you can see, this pattern of expected, expected, impacts repeats with more follow-up. Um, the gray shaded line you see at the 18-month point gives you the sense of the rough point in this pattern when the 18-month survey measured many, but not all, of the program's expected impacts. And the rest of the slides show impacts, so let's turn to them. Um, this next slide shows that Save USA increased the deposit of 2011 tax refunds into savings. And given that the rest of the slides follow the same format, I'll explain this one uh, in detail. Uh, Tulsa and New York City Save uh, sample members are combined here. And in each panel, the top bar, the red one, shows the behavior of the regular tax filers, while the bottom bar, the blue one, shows the Save USA group. Um, and in this slide, the top bar shows that according to tax return records, 15% of the regular tax filers directly deposited at least some of the tax refund that they received in 2011 directly into some type of savings. For example, a savings account or a savings bond. So this 15% uh, represents what people who enrolled in the study would do in the absence um, of Save USA and illustrates a point that Joe made earlier. Um, in contrast, uh, looking at the blue bar, 93% of the Save USA group did this. The difference between these two bars, a 78 percentage point increase, represents the effect or impact of Save USA on depositing money from tax refunds into savings in 2011. Uh, the stars under the 93% indicate the results of a statistical test that shows how confident we are that the difference between the two bars is not due to chance. The more stars, the higher our confidence. And if there are no stars, we can't rule out that the difference between the two groups occurred by chance. So as you can see here, we're very confident that Save USA increased people's likelihood of depositing into savings from tax refunds in 2011. And note that much of this uh, increase likely reflects a large number of people uh, deposited, depositing money initially into Save USA accounts. Looking at the bottom panel of this same slide, uh, we see that Save USA also increased the amount of tax refunds that people directly deposited into savings. The in, it increased this amount by $460. Next slide, uh, please. This slide shows that Save USA also increased the percent of 2011 study enrollees who, in 2012, the next year, deposited all or part of their tax refund into savings. This impact um, and the ones shown in the rest of the slides are based on surveys of study enrollees 18 months after study entry. The top bar shows that 35% of the regular tax filers reported in the survey that they deposited at least some of the tax refund that they received in 2012 into savings. And in contrast, 61% of the Save USA group reported doing this. Thus, Save USA produced a 26 percentage point increase in depositing money from tax refunds into savings during enrollees second year in the study. Uh, the next slide follows the same format. And this one shows that 72% of regular tax filers reported that they, uh, 18 months after study entry, that they had some money that they considered to be savings 
For example, money in savings accounts, a minimum balance maintained in their checking accounts, cash they had set aside for savings. Um, and in contrast, 79% of the Save USA group reported this. Thus, Save USA increased the proportion of people with savings 18 months out by seven percentage points. You can also see here that regular tax filers reported having an average of about $1,700 in savings as of the 18-month follow-up point, and Save USA increased this by about $511. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we show some results on support for savings. In addition to encouraging people to save at all or to save more, Save USA was also intended to result in people having more of a commitment to saving. And measured in different ways, it appears that it did. Uh, shown in the top half of this slide, Save USA resulted in more people saying that they had a savings goal compared to what would have happened in the absence of the program. Um, also shown in the bottom half of the slide, the program resulted in more people saying that they thought it very important to have money in a savings account. Um, the next slide shows more results related to support for commitment to savings. In the top half, you can see that Save USA increased the percent of people who said, relative to when that they, they were randomly assigned and entered the study, that they were using more of their tax refund for savings. And in the bottom half, you can see that Save USA increased the percent of people who said, again relative to uh, study entry, that they were keeping money in savings longer. The next slide looks at um, impacts on debt. Um, some policy experts have hoped that programs like Save USA could reduce people's debt. If people use their set-aside savings or extra money they got in savings matches to help pay down debt. Other people have feared that Save USA's promise of a 50% match might lead some people to increase their debt if that was necessary for them to save for a year and get the match. But as you can see in this slide, Save USA has at this point had no effect on debt in a positive or negative way as of the 18-month follow-up point. Both research groups had on average a high level of debt, of debt, but the averages did not differ across the two research groups. The next slide uh, shows some uh, results for financial hardship or well-being. Um, this reflects the, looking at these um, outcomes reflects that one of the theories behind Save USA is the notion that having even small amounts of savings can help people avoid financial hardship, can prevent small financial problems from spiraling into bigger ones, and can increase people's overall financial well-being. But as of the 18-month point, Save USA has not had these effects. Looking at the top half, of the slide, the proportion of people who reported having used any type of high-cost credit since study entry, such as payday loans, overdrawing their, credit, their checking accounts, or increasing their credit card balances, is the same for the two research groups. And as you can see in the bottom half, identical proportions of both research groups uh, reported having had a financial hardship since study entry. We also did not find any effect on what some people call average liquid net worth. So, so far we're talking about results for New York City and uh, Tulsa combined. The next two slides uh, break down results by city. Um, and I'll just say overall, uh, we find that Save USA's effects were not different by city. Um, the levels of some reported behaviors or attitudes did differ, but uh, we see, for example, in this slide that both cities increased the percentage of people who deposited at least some of their 2012 tax refund into savings. And then in the next slide, we see that while the average amount of savings increased in both cities, we don't have confidence that this did not occur by chance. This is likely due to the smaller sample sizes when each city is considered by itself. 
So that's the end of the presentation of results. Um, this next slide, we show what's next. Um, all of the results shown in this presentation, as well as many others, uh, can be found in the recently released Save USA report, which is on the MDRC website. Next steps in the study include administration of our longer-term uh, survey, analysis of the data from that survey, and then issuance of a final evaluation report in late 2015. Um, in the next slide, uh, we just show some uh, email addresses of people you can contact if you have questions about the Save USA uh, study, and do feel free to contact us. And I will close things there and hand things, I think, back to Emily. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Thank you to uh, all three of our presenters, in fact, I, I've, uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, it's interesting to see how the lesson, how the ideas from behavioral economics that uh, Mr. Valenti presented at the beginning have been brought to life in the uh, experiments that we that we heard about um, uh, by the second two presenters. I'm now going to switch over to uh, the question and answer section of today's presentation. We have received a couple of questions already, but as a reminder. If you would like to ask a question of any of our presenters, you can do so using the Q&A pod at the bottom right-hand side of the, of the screen. Just type in a question, and we'll go ahead and uh, verbally uh, address those. So the first one that we received uh, was uh, targeted to Michal Greenstein-Weiss, and uh, regarding the refund to savings um, initiative the, for the presenters, uh, for the participants, what percentage saved into a bank account versus what percentage used savings bonds as a vehicle for their savings? Hi. Um, so in our sample, very, there was very low take up of the savings bonds. It's less than 1% and the majority who put into savings, put it into a saving account. Okay, great. Um, it looks like we have a Second question for um, for uh, Dr. Greenstein Weiss: uh, How si significant? Can you talk about the significance of the results um, in terms of uh, for the individuals who benefited, or the savings uh, meaningful enough, meaningful to, and large enough to make a meaningful difference to the savers uh, given their uh, their economic circumstances? So this is an uh, excellent question. Um, First, if I, you know, in terms of thinking about that the result of a six-month impact, we found that to be significant that, you know, something as small as a quick behavioral intervention that can be developed at scale can have a kind of, you know, a long-term impact or a six-month impact to be, you know, specific. So we found that to be significant. In terms of the increased savings, you know, on average, so amount the people who we did, the, the splitters, which is, you know, um, of course, self-selected because it's people who motivated, but still, uh, for them, it's an uh, additional 200 to 250 in saving, you know, across the tax season. Uh, I wouldn't say it's a very large amount, but it still seems to be, you know, a good enough money to, to say aside. Um, and that's the difference. So altogether, so that's like $200 in additional savings. So altogether, people on average put like $600 or $800 into savings, and, and that together seems to be, you know, half of the $2,000 uh, benchmark that we have from the Tufan and Lozardi study. So it's definitely something that can be meaningful. The important, okay. again, just the important thing to emphasize on our study is trying to think about coming to this, coming to trying to approach this problem from, um, from the field that's looking for also kind of a scalable solution that are low cost and low touch. So intervention that, that doesn't require the load but can still have an impact. Right, of course, you always have to find that balance. And then there was actually a second part to that question and it was asking how do the results of the current refund to savings initiative compare to the results of the savings study done with H&R Block several years ago. Are you familiar with that one? 
I am somewhat familiar that was more like incentives to get people to, but it, it was financial incentives. So, so I think the direction, you know, it's somewhat hard to compare because it's that the, the agent of black was a financial incentive giving people, a, you know, incentives to put money into saving account and here we did not use the financial incentive. So both of them found to be successful, but I think the HNO block used, you know, financial incentives, and we didn't. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next question we have was um, was directed towards uh, Gail Hamilton uh, about the uh, Save USA program, and someone has asked, oh, are there plans to expand this initiative to new states and cities and filing areas in the upcoming years? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are um, a number of organizations and cities that are interested in this Save USA model. Um, and uh, I think a few are changing it somewhat and implementing it in their local context. Um, there's also However, um, a, uh, an, uh, it's actually proposed legislation uh, to embed something like Save USA into the federal tax code. Um, and you know, this is um, called the Financial Security Credit Act uh, that was introduced in August 2013. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with that. All right, we will uh, we will definitely have to keep an, an eye out on that then. Um, the next question that we have was uh, actually for both of the presenters uh, that are uh, examining new research, and the question addressed: How does the timing of filing of filers uh, um, to requesting their uh, filing their taxes influence um, the effect of the savings outcome. So for example, if a filer uh, filed their taxes in February versus doing it in April, did that have any influence on what you would have seen? I, I'm happy to go first. Um, this is Michal. Uh, we see a very, very strong impact of timing. So in general, I think you know it's quite known in the field that people who have larger refunds usually tend to file the refund earlier. Um, and then we also see, you know, people are saving more when they have larger refunds. So larger refunds, you know, they're filing earlier and they're also saving more. That's what we find. People are quite different who file in January compared to people who file in April. So the earlier filers are also saving more? Yes. They get and I think it's coming from two forces. It's earlier uh, filers save more, but I think there is an intermediate factor, which is the refund amount. Earlier filers tend to have larger amount, and that mm -hmm. can impact also the decision to save more. But there is uh, definitely a clear relationship with people who file early um, save more, but also I think it's re you know related to them also have larger refund. Okay. Yeah. Great. This is. This is Gail. We, um, in, in our data, we saw that same pattern um, and, um, you know, attribute it to the same things that McCall just mentioned. Um, you know, so people who are anticipating larger refunds file their taxes earlier, and people who um, and have larger refunds are more likely to save. However, you know, this is, uh, this is kind of a correlational thing. Um, I will note looking at the effects, the impacts of the Save USA intervention, um, we did not see a difference. Um, looking at people who, you know, looking at impacts of Save USA among people who filed their taxes early in the season compared to people who filed their taxes later in the season. Impacts were the same for those two groups. Interesting that it kind of, uh evened out that way. All right, the, uh, the next question we had uh, was, was again for you, for uh, Ms. Hamilton, uh, Dr. Hamilton. Um, did you have any issues with accessing 
IRS data about the quote unquote regular file, filers control group? Um, everyone who was interested in the Save USA initiative and um, uh, enrolled in the study um, completed informed consent forms uh, before they were randomly assigned and uh, gave MDRC permission as part of the study, the evaluation, to access their tax returns, um, to access their um, uh, account information at the participating financial um, institutions um, and to access other data we were interested in. So um, no, uh, we, you know, uh, if, and if, if someone was unwilling prior to being randomly assigned to sign the informed consent forms, um, we could not randomly assign them and include them in the, um, in the study. Okay, so that was part of the design. Mm-hmm. Take that into account. Great. Uh, the next question is going back to uh, Mikhail Greenstein Weiss. To what degree are the lessons you're learning from this online platform uh, adaptable and applicable to use in a VITA volunteer income tax assistance setting? So we have a lot of discussion with VITA sites and how to incorporate some of the learning. I think some of the um, people on VITA side uh, uh, were kind of informed, inspired by our intervention and incorporated some of behavioral economics uh, when they're working one-on-one -on -one and um, setting goals, etc., trying to use prompt. Um, you know, we are still in the thinking about how we can do more direct connection and work more closely with them, but definitely we had some uh, informal interaction and knowing that they will get to the people at the right side and they are trying to incorporate some of these changes. The difference, of course, because we are using a web server, you know, and it's a little bit different than the regular work happening at the right side. Okay, great. And I, I guess I want to ask the same question that, uh, that went out to uh, Gail Hamilton of, 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 um, of you, uh, Mikal, are there plans to expand the initiative uh, throughout other users of the TurboTax program? That, that's the goal. We don't have a, you know, a final commitment yet. We are working with the Intuit to explore um, you know, other avenues. We're definitely continuing the initiative. So uh, already in 2014, this year, we have tested other things like new things like pre-communications and dry test of account opening and um, new behavioral economic techniques within the free file, but we are thinking about expanding it even beyond free file to other Intuit customers. But nothing is finalized or set, it's just in the work and you know, in the planning right now for future years. Sure, sure. Okay, uh, the next question we had was again for, uh, for both of the presenters and asking about were there any um, different outcomes seen for rural um, participants? But I'm not, I, but help me understand if that's even data that can be parsed out from each of your experiments. Um, this is Gail, I can go first, um, Nicole. Um, uh, our, you know, our two impact, uh, you know, locations or cities were New York City and Tulsa, Oklahoma. So really in New York City, we, we basically have no rural participants. Um, in Tulsa, um, I doubt we had many um, rural participants. Um, uh, I don't think we have data on that, but um, Save USA in Tulsa was, was offered at several VITA sites um, that were in the city of Tulsa. Um, so the, to the extent that rural tax filers uh, traveled into Tulsa to file their taxes, um, we could have some uh, uh, you know, rural participants um, in our sample, but I would think it would be a small number. Um, and we have not segmented 
our impact or effectiveness results um, by urban rural um, um, because I, I mean I, I don't know that we identified those people but also my guess is there are just too few of them to do any kind of analysis on them. Yes and um, this is Michal we do have a national you know survey national population so we do have urban and rural but we have not done analysis yet by urban and rural so that will be an interesting thing to pursue. All right, for when you're writing your, uh, your next grant funding, uh, your research questions for your next round of research, we can yeah. look into that. <laughs> and I'm sure everyone on the call today will be uh, interested to find out uh, what you, uh, to learn about your results from the, the final stages of uh, both of your experiments and uh, the future work that you do. So I, uh, that's a, the last end of the questions that we've received. So I want to uh, thank both of our, thank all three of our presenters, uh, Joe Valenti from the Center for American Progress, Dr. Michael Grinstein Weiss from the Center for Social Development, and Dr. Gail Hamilton from MDRC for their thoughtful uh, presentations about the, the work that they're doing and why they're, and the impacts that it can have on um, the work that's being done with low-income families looking to build self-sufficiency. Uh, for researchers, uh, practitioners, and policymakers, which is the, the target audiences of us here uh, for the uh, SSRC. If you are interested in learning more about the work that are done by any of our three presenters, I would invite you to access the file that is available um, through the, the Adobe Connect platform called SSRC Resources Authored by Speakers. And that is a list of resources that appear in the SSRC library by each of our three speakers. So you can um, de delve even deeper into the topics of their interest. So thank you again to the speakers. And thank you again to the audience for your participation today. Thank you. Thank you all. Once again, that does conclude today's conference. We appreciate your participation.